so I guess we have to start because this is exactly the right time. I want to start at the right time. And welcome everyone to this session, which is about how to build reactive server engine. In order to save your time, because before any, any other preparation and intro to what we are going to do, I want to save your time because I want to let you know, as, let you learn as much as possible. That's why I want to share a little bit for whom this talk. So you will be able to go to another room or to another session and learn something better. So this talk is for people who want to learn how Neo works and learn more a little bit about Neo, kind of GDK Neo, the, the lowest level of integration with non-blocking I.O. If you want to learn a little bit about project reactor in action, this also be kind of really useful to you because we are going to we are going to discuss a little bit about uh, some operators in Project Reactor. And of course, if you want to understand how Reactive Approach feeds to the server-side engine on the, lower, on the lowest layer, then this will be also really useful to you. So if you are still with me, then let's, let's go and let me introduce myself then. My name is Oleg. I'm from Ukraine, from, from Kiev. I work for a Netify company where we are building uh, amazing product called RSocket. The next session will be dedicated to that, uh, to that product. And actually, I am contributor to Project Reactor, so I know everything about how it's going on inside Reactor and how it works, etc. So if you have any questions, just ping me. And also, I am organizing some conferences in Ukraine, so if you want to learn and go to learn technologies related to Java and enjoy Kiev and Ukraine, please come to those conferences or ping me. I'll share some, some discounts to you. All right, I also wrote a book related to reactive programming in, in Sprint, but this is a little bit of marketing. And now our main goal, our agenda. So we will start with understanding what we want to see as a reactive server engine. That will be the beginning. Then why do we need reactive server engine? Or why, for example, existing blocking technology doesn't fit real world problems? And finally, we will do some live coding on implementing reactive server engine. That's our plan. All right, sounds good? Great, so let's go. First of all, what we want to see under reactive server engine, we want to see server. This is the main, the main part of our, of our implementation. And that server should be able to accept connection and we have to provide some, uh, some ability to handle those, que so those connections using, for example, reactive programming model. This is an important part. Then what we want to have, we want to have some pool of workers or, or pool of threads which will be attached to every new connection and this connection will share, for example, a few available workers. And then, once it happens, we want to have some back pressure control because this is important. Reactive programming is, is about, and reactive streams is about back pressure control, and we want to preserve our resource in, in kind of in a normal state and keep application just working. That's why we want to control back pressure in the way if we, want, if we can write something to to our output, to our connection, then we can ask for, for new data and not other way. So once we, we, we receive, for example, back pressure request or flow control request, for example, give me a few more bytes, the server will start sending our data. We will apply some transformation to it, to them, and send back. That's what we want to have uh, in our reactive server engine. From the code perspective, it could, like, it could look like that. So in a few words. We want to accept or we want to create our server by defining the host and port like that. Then we want to define our kind of connection handler in this way. This is pretty similar. Maybe if you attended R2DBC talk, you saw something similar because this is kind of common pattern for handling new connections. And then we want to have kind of a straightforward way to read some data from this connection using, for example, receive method and to send some data back using a common, common name at method send. In both cases, it will be reactive streams. We want to use project reactor in it because it's a common way to, to send some data, to send and process some data in reactive fashion. By the way, how many of you are familiar with project reactor? Used it before? Okay, a few hands. Have you ever heard about Rx Java maybe before or use it? So I guess the same people. All right, so a little bit of you heard about that project. 
it's basically about reactive programming and reactive streams processing, so we want to use it in this way. And of course, in, in order to start this engine, we want to call start, and of course, to keep main thread running, we want to block it, the whole execution. In a few words, everything is written in reactive fashion, as you can see. <coughs> the main question that you should ask me, why do we need that? Why do we need reactive server engine? In order to demonstrate that, or in order to show why do we need, I'm going to show you why, what's wrong with blocking I.O. So let's do some small demo in order to understand what's wrong with blocking I.O. For that purpose, I'm going to run plain socket server. So this is the simplest, lowest layer implementation of socket server, which simply starts on port 8080, accept connection. This is a normal way to, to accept connection and to process data in, uh, in lowest in GDK IO, on, on the GDK IO level. So what we want to have, we want to accept connection. We want to read some data from the input stream. And we want to process some lines by sending echo message back. So let's just start this plain application. And let's see how it works. So it started. Yeah, if you noticed, in order to run everything and to start everything really quickly, I use Graal here because Graal is about quick startup and quick data processing. So I'm using it here. And now let's connect to my application using Telnet. So I connected and now I can write hello world and I got a hello and echo message. Do you see it? I got echo message. So basically it works. So I'm go I'm, I am able to write some data and observe some echo response back. So in general, it works. So what's wrong with that? First of all, when I try to open another connection, not kill Java, but open another connection, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen because, do you think that, do you know the answer why nothing happens? The answer is really simple. We have only one thread which process, process data, and if this, thread is kind of occupied by previous connection, and it's occupied by previous connection, the new one won't be able to, to start kind of process data. This, that's why it's a little bit of problem. Of course, obvious solution for that will be creating some thread pool like that. So this is a normal way to create thread pool. Use, for example, in that case, some few available uh, processors in, on my machine. For demo purpose, let, let's just put, for example, four threads to process all the data. And let's replace this plain connection logic with the same but ran executed on the thread pool. So the, the main difference is now that once I accepted the connection, I want to execute it on specific thread pool or, or on specific thread. Is it clear? OK, so this is the simplest. The main logic is pretty similar. So once I process everything, the connection will be uh, freed. So let's restart and let's see whether it works or not. So let's connect. Yeah, this works. Let's connect again. This works again. Cool, better at least. So let's not kill Java, but works. So another one. Not kill Java. Please save Java. Uh, yes. And this one works. Great. So seems like it's fine. But what about another one connection? Oh, this one doesn't work. Because we exhausted all the, the thread pool and we don't have any available threads to process data. And if, you, if we are going to stop this program or use it, we will see that we have some task in the queue. And if we will try to open more connection, eventually we, we will get queue out of size exception or something like that which means that we don't have any available threads and memory in the, or space in the queue. So another obvious solution to that will be providing what? What we do when we want to handle lots of, lots of request, blocking requests. Schedule it on cache thread pool, right? Why not to use, for example, cache thread pool in order to handle all connections? Because as you might note, might know the cache thread pool allows you to create as many threads as you want, right? So let's try this and see what happened. Of course, in this case, we will have lots of threads and we will be able to open as many connections as we want, but we won't try to reproduce this using my console and my terminal. 
In order to test how resilient such application could be, I created a small evil dosser. I call this small application dosser. And what this application does is basically open 10,000 of connections and try to spam my server with as many data as it, ha as it can. So the simplest. Let's just try whether it can, yeah, I guess it works. So let's just try to run my app and see whether my main server implemented in such way could survive or not. So for some reason it stopped. What do you think, what happened? Your idea. Right. We got out of memory. Because thread is somewhat really expensive in Java. It takes usually one megabyte of your memory and it's really, it's really expensive for, for just running everything on new, on new thread. That's why it's a really bad connection model, really bad kind of processing model to have one thread per connection. And that's why blocking could not survive. Either you have to limit your number of threads and in, in that case limit of number of simultaneous connection processed by your, by your server or you have to handle lots of threads and that's why you have to kind of pay lots of money for a really huge machine with huge amount of memory and huge amount of processors. That's why blocking is not good. So let's back to our slides and let's try to do some summary to see some drawbacks of blocking AR. First of all, it's an efficient resource usage because you have to, sp in case of thread per connection model, it will take lots of memory. Increase, it will increase latency because in, th in this case you, you want to kind of process, uh, you want to process something in the really concurrent environment, it will be hardly possible to, to manage some, to really schedule everything properly. That's why your latency will significantly uh, increase. And finally, it's easy to DDoS such, such application because some, someone can kind of understand how many memory you allocated for your app and doing some such things like long live at connection, it, it can crush, uh, that person can really DDoS your servers. So that's why we need non-blocking I.O. So let's try to understand what non-blocking I.O. and how non-blocking I.O. looks like. So first of all, in non-blocking I.O., the main, uh, the essential part of everything is server socket channel. Server socket channel has another kind of control part or uh, part of non-blocking execution, which is called selector. So using selector, you can start listening to, for example, incoming connection, for example, using uh, operation accept. So once you got a new connection, the server channel will notify you about new user or new connection open it in a few words. So what next? Once you got a new connection to your server, you have to listen to some data, right? But what I, what, what I want to kind of emphasize here, you can't just say to server, ser server socket channel, now I want to listen to operation reads. Now you have to go to connection, use the same selector, but now you have this to register this selector to this socket channel. This is how socket IO works. You can't just use the same place to do everything. You have to split, you have to do move, more movements and more exercises in order to start listening to particular events from this connection. And this kind of not good design from as, as for me. All right, but what next? All right, suppose you got some few bytes of data. Of course, you want to start reading them, right? That's usual operation. So you want to start processing them da those data, you process them, and you want to write them back, right? That's usual operation or operational flow. So you want to send those data back. But what can happen? It can happen that only one part of the data could be written to, to, to socket channel. Because in non-blocking world, there is no guarantee that connection is TCP connection can handle all the data. That's why it's non-blocking. And in case, for example, you just wrote only one part of your, your byte buffer, for example, you have to store this byte buffer to somewhere and then you have to listen to another type of operations related to write. And in that case, socket channel will notify you once it has available kind of space to write some data to, to, to it again, it will notify about write operations. And then only after that, you will be able to try 
to write it again. So this is the main flow of non-blocking interaction with kind of Neo. How it looks like from the code perspective? This is basically the main setup of a non-blocking server. First of all, you have to create an open socket channel, bind it to specific address, similarly to just blocking IO. But the important part that you have to say, this is non-blocking communication. So you have to configure non-blocking explicitly. This is another drawback. Then you have to open selector. This is another part. You have to start listening, for example, on the SAP event. And then you have to loop over it. Of course, this part will, be, will block your loop execution. It won't just spin your CPU, but it will block until new connection. So once you got new connection, selector will execute the code inside it, and then you will be able to do some actions. OK, let's try to, to see what we can do inside this once we got new connection, for example. To accept new connection, we have to say accept. We have to configure it in non-blocking fashion again. And then we have to put it in some collection, because there is no other way to, to store the connections. We have to, to manage them ourselves. And this is another challenge that happens with non-blocking AI. Finally, we have to register that you are ready. You have to, to, to show your intent that you are ready to read some data from this connection. And only after that, you will be able, for example, to, to start uh, process the data. This is another part. This is a part related to data reading. So once you get a notification about available data, you have to, again, get the channel, allocate some buffer for reading the data, and of course, put the, data, to put the buffer somewhere. Because for now, it's unclear how to send those buffers, those data, to, for example, user logic. Because what we want to build, we want to build uh, some, some normal server which allows everyone to put a listener, put a listener and then process every, every byte buffer that came from, from the connection. And how to do that in this model, it's another challenge. Actually, I don't know how to implement that correctly, because this requires to use imperative programming, because for now, it's all, everything is in imperative programming. And it could be a little kind of unclear, as for me. And finally, once we wrote, once we read some data from, from the connection, we want to say, OK, let me know when I can write some data back to, to this channel. And once we get another K notification, we will be able to start writing data to the channel. Yes, we have to, to find our queue associated with this channel. And then we will, then we will have to, to iteratively write this data back to the channel. So this is basically what happens with such execution. After all, once you've wrote everything you had, you have to say again, I want to listen to read data. And this is basically the workflow in non-blocking AO. Do you think it's a little bit complex? Do you agree with that? Yes, this is really complex. And I actually don't want to kind of tackle all of this infrastructural code. So let's summarize. Where is the complexity here? First of all, NEO in general is really complex. It's, it's designed to not the kind of regular developers and only kind of abnormal people can, can work with that without any problems. Then selector and data is absolutely unrelated. In case you want to handle your data, you have to do lots of movement and exercises to, to make it correctly. And it's easy to, to shoot yourself in the leg. That's why it's yeah, complex, another point of complexity. And yeah, reads and writes is also a complex operation and because you have to count that everything is non-blocking. All right, so let's now talk how to implement that design that I mentioned at the very beginning, how to create this beautiful functional and reactive solution on top of our functional and reactive NEO implementation or API uh, on top of that. First of all, we have to, to care about back pressure. And what we want to have, we want to, yeah, we want to have some multi-threading. And of course, in previous solution, this, is, this will be hardly, hardly handled. In general, once you start working with that, you will, you will like Homer in front of a reactive factory. All right. In general, there is a good, uh, good point, good word from well-known guy who say, don't fall from, from complexity. 
run from it, right? So we want to we wanna evolve from it, we want to run away from it. That's why let's run from it, let's run to reactive streams, and let's try to implement everything using asynchronous, non-blocking pro kind of streaming, because reactive streams is about it. And streaming model is somewhat natural to, to Neo, because what you do, you read bytes from connection, and connection in general is a stream of bytes, right? So it, it naturally fits uh, each other. So let's try to, to do that because also reactive streams provide us with building back pressure. In turn, oh, sorry. in turn, we are going to use Project Reactor because Project Reactor is a superset on react kind of or on reactive streams libraries. This implementation it provides us with extensive set of operators and it has built-in model for really useful and si simple manipulation by threads. So let's do it. Let's code it finally. And let's go to, to our code. Let's kill Java first of all. This is important to kill Java before, before anything. So let me close it and say kill Java. Great, I kill Java. And now let's try to rewrite this guy. And let's first start with, with our reactive API. What we want to achieve, we want to what at every, after every iteration, we will try to run this piece of code and we will try to figure out whether it works or not. Okay, does it make sense? Hope it does. So here is, there is, uh, here is just essential implementation of, uh, this is just an API, I would say, of our reactive server. Under the hood, we don't have anything, so if we're going to, to see the implementation, we will see empty, empty kind of implementation, and from that point, we are going to, we will, we will start implementing everything. So in order to, since we have everything reactive, and we have to return our kind of server, we have to make startup of the server asynchronous, we have to, to write everything, everything in a synchronous fashion, and that's why I'm going to, to start with writing, not that one, but this, this a few startup actions. So what, what do we do here? First of all, we've wrote a convenient way to, to listen to some subscribers, so we, we, we want to create some uh, source of data in that case, which will push new connections to downstream. Of course, we will ignore them because it doesn't, uh, imp it's not important to, to, to for startup, but that's how we start. Then what we want to have, we want to have, we want to run our kind of main business logic hidden inside our push or inside our kind of source on a different thread. For To do that, we create another scheduler. So scheduler is a part of Project Reactor, which allows us to create a thread pool, okay? To thread pool on which this part of the logic will run, will be ran. Is it clear? Okay. Then we just ignore everything and convert our flux to, to mono and that's it. The next step will be writing and implementing, of course, some plain Neo interaction. So to, to, to start working with Neo, you have to just, to, to, to just stop a few lines of code like that. So really easy, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I decided to, 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 to simplify and to sacrifice explaining and writing everything by myself. So I'm going to explain what's going on. Here is the same as you have seen on the slides. This is startup of socket channel. Here I mark it as non-blocking. Then I open selector in order to listen to, to actions specified by this selector key. And then I do some actions in order to, to listen for example, to cancellation of the stream. So there is a convenient way to, to listen to cancellation, which is sync on dispose uh, handler. And in that way, once I got cancellation action, I, I will just close my server and that's it. Then we have a loop, which will be running until something is canceled. And here is the selection that you have seen before, right? Identical code. Now we are going to, to just try to implement part of the logic here. But we have to understand what do we want to have here. Here we just want, we have, we, in, in this, by this action, we simply accept the new connection, right? So this guy returns us another socket channel which represents the connection between, uh, between our client and what we handled on the server side. Here we mark it as non-blocking. Now we have another kind of uh, representation or implementation around it which will provide us with reactive API and that should sound some, somewhat like connection, right? 
you want to some some wrapper around socket channel which will be named as connection so here i have this interface call it connection which has only two methods which i mentioned on the slides the first one allows us to to listen to incoming byte buffers right and the second one will simply allows us to send those data back to the stream is it clear simply simple interface so let's go to the implementation this is placeholder class for that which doesn't have any implementation so far and from that point we are going to implement the rest of the thing so first of all we have to to give a little bit of data or uh, information to this connection about outside world first of all what what worth to mention is that connection will be, will be kind of will be responsible for data reading and data writing and we don't want to move this responsibility to to the main server engine because it will just uh, confuse everything and disallow us to to work easily with this with this code that's why we are going to to ask main server for some kind of main required fields for example for for some fields related to socket channel so we will ask for connection or actual representation of socket channel uh, from gdk neo and also we are going to to ask in order to kind of decouple the server engine and our uh, kind of or source of selection from our connection we want to have some notifications or way to to listen to some new notifications or actions from the main engine and since this is kind of stream of updates we can use the same kind of programming model using uh, project using project reactor and basically when we want to listen to for example to read updates or to the ability to, re to read from the connection we want to subscribe to some stream of data right the same for writes if you want to read to if you want to listen to some writes updates or for some notification that we can write data to 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 to, to connection we want to listen to flux of another so selection keys that's what we want to have and here some basics construction of this uh, this this part we don't want to <laughs> dig into this deeper but now what we want to uh, try to implement is receiving and sending logic in order to receive data we have to listen to read notify to to read kind of notifications right so once we got a notification that we can read something from this uh, from from the connection we should start read from it and basically we have to, to use our read notifier in order to start listening on the other hand to start listening for uh, for read events we have to register kind of listener right we have do you remember that part that they have shown you on the slides related to to, to this let me show you this again in order to get new updates you have to define do you see it you have to say i want to listen to read updates right but the main question since we have everything reactive and if we are going to take a look at our business logic and this business logic could be written in absolutely different manner for example we can delay our subscription we can do some asynchronous action we can send we can create some proxy server which will send data to another server and of course we don't know when we get for example when the endpoint or consumer logic will be able to to start listening for the data that's why we don't want to start listening too early so we don't want to register too early for for incoming uh, read notifications and that's why we want to register only and only when when the kind of our business logic send us a subscription or notification that it's ready the convenient way to listen to to that action is of course by doing by listening or by adding operator on subscribe do on subscribe and what it gives us so once someone subscribe to our kind of stream we are absolutely ready to start doing something and this will be the main point uh, and the main kind of start point for our listening to 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 read notifications so what we're going what we are going to do <coughs> we will try to implement something like something like that not that sorry read yeah receiver here we go this is what we have to write first of all we have to add a kind of handler for do on subscribe action so once we get a subscriber we will try to find our selector 
and we are going to, to register our selector to our socket channel, and in this way, wake up the whole execution and say, okay, now we are ready to, to read data. We are fine. Then, in order to, to keep the latest selection key, because this is important, this is another trick, you can't use the same selection key everywhere. You have to listen to new updates, and in case you, you, you will try to use the older one, uh, you will be able to, to register in other events, and this is another problem with, with Neo. So every, every new update, every new selection key notification, you have to store it in the field. Of course, this, this part of the code allows us to clean up connection, for example, on can cancellation action, and this is the main part of the logic, which allows us to read few bytes from the channel, do you see it? And then, in case we have some data in the channel, we will try to send it. I want to pay your attention that, of course, we could write something like that. Let me show you. We could write something like that. We could write something like that. And of course, we can write something like, like that. Let me show you. But I want to pay your attention that now in reactive streams is illegal. You may try to do something <laughs> like that, but once you get now return it to, to, your, uh, to your map operator, you will get an exception which will close your reactive streams. It's important to remember that null is kind of pro uh, forbidden uh, re result of mapping, for example, and you can't send any nulls to during your uh, data streaming. That's important. That's why there is another conven convenient way implemented in handle operator. And what you have to do, if you have some data, it provides you with something. Let me just replace lambda with an anonymous class. It provides you with synchronous sync. And what you have to do during this execution, you have to, you have to either execute this sync with next, or you can easily complete this execution by saying thing, so you have kind of, you can keep hands on control of everything that's going on inside the stream. This is important part. And this allows us to either send some data or just filter or skip the event. This is important part of reactors that you have to remember. All right, let's go to data sending. All we have to do basically at the data sending part, you have to subscribe to, to the stream because we want to, as, as I mentioned, we have to keep all the logic of reading and writing inside the connection because connection is part, is responsible for all kind of interaction with, with real connection. That's why we want to do all this uh, action inside connection. And of course, we have to create subscriber. But as you can see, subscriber is a little bit of kind of, uh, we have to write a little bit of uh, implementation for that. That's why we maybe want to use some convenient way for project from Project Reactor, which is base subscriber. But in general, I don't want to create another object because more object to garbage collector, more uh, the less performance we gain. We want to produce less object to, to our environment. That's why the more kind of con convenient way to do that is to just extend base subscriber like this. And to implement this plain logic inside the same class, it, this won't be kind of prohibited. So what we want to have, we want to have a byte buffer subscriber implemented here. And we are looking for two main methods required for our, uh, for our implementation. The first one is hook on subscribe, which allows us to override kind of manipulation under subscription. And using subscription, now we can say how many objects or how many elements we are ready to read, right? This is a way to, to start control, to, to start doing flow control between the upstream and downstream. And at this point, to just start everything, to, st to just start execution, we want to request only one byte buffer from the connection, and this will start our execution. On the other hand, we want to listen to some incoming byte buffer. So we want to override hook on next, we want to listen to incoming buffer. And what we want to do, we want to write some simple piece of code like this. Not like this, but like writer. Not. We want to write some, yeah, simple piece of code like this, which simply 
just write data to, to socket channel. In case we got some weird result, which is minus one, it means that something went wrong with our connection, so we have to simply cancel our execution. And what we want to have to do then, in case everything is fine, and we wrote all the data, we have to simply request for another piece of data, right? This is the simplest execution flow. We wrote some data, we requested for another few bytes of data, and that's it. Of course, there is a few corner cases here. For example, just imagine that you were, you were not able to, to write everything at once in one connection, and of course you have to store that by buffer, because now we have to listen to write updates. So we have to store receive it by buffer to a field, which is here, so I, 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 hid, in, uh, I hid it. And now we have to store it, this by buffer here. We have to interact with selection key again and define our intent to listen to write updates. But now the question, how we will be notified about this write updates? We have this stream of notification, so we have to somehow use it. We have to use it at the very beginning of, of, of execution, and since very, the very beginning of ex execution is, of course, on subscribe method, because once we got a subscription, everything runtime is, has started. That's why we have to put interaction with listening on write updates here, and it will could look like that. So what we do? What do we do basically here? We listen for notifications about write in that case. Uh, about write selection keys. This will be write selection key. And once we get it, we just simply have to say, okay, now just stop notifying me about write availability because in case we won't do that, it will just spin the processor every every second by sending the <coughs> I'm ready to write, I'm able to write some data, I'm able to write some data. And this is somewhat we don't want to have here. That's why we immediately, once we get a notification about read, kind of write ability, we say, okay, now we want to read, listen to reads. Don't notify me about writes updates. And then we have to, to, yeah, this part should be hidden. We will back to this, to this a little bit later. But basically what we have to do, we have to send our kind of try. We will send the same stored buffer previously to, to execution in the main logic. That's what we want to do afterwards. So once we got a notification about writeability, it means that uh, we have some data to write and we have to try to write them back again. And afterwards, if everything is successful, we'll request some for some new uh, bytes from, from incoming stream. So this is the whole execution model. So let's check whether, yeah, we have to just subscribe here. We have to write a few more lines of code because everything should be asynchronous and reactive, so we have to start everything only when someone subscribed to our send mono. So that's why we have to use from runnable, we have to do something like that, and then we have to only after that we have to subscribe to, to our data stream. That's how it should, like, should look like. So let's try to, to finalize everything. Let's try to put some piece of logic here. So what we have to do right now, we have to do some <coughs> process kind of some notification or stream for notification management. So in order to provide our connection, so here we have our duplex connection here, we have provided with some way to notify about, with some kind of implementation of streams for reads and writes. And one of the options to manually supply data to the stream, because we want to manually push data to the stream, we want to basically use, for example, processors, because processors is a part of reactive streams uh, specification. It provides you implementation of boss, of, of, um, of publisher and subscriber. So basically what can downstream do, it can subscribe to the stream, and you, what you can do, you can use, for example, methods like on next in order to push data to, to your subscriber manually. So this is a way to, to do that. And once we provided everything, store it somewhere in the map, which is required part of, of managing all the things, because we have some, somehow associate particular processors with particular uh, kind of channel. Then we have to, to listen to read notifications. And of course, once we get it, we have to find out to which, to which kind of uh, 
which connection has those processors, and then we have to send a particular notification to, this, to that processor. And of course, we have to write absolutely identical logic for, for writes in order to notify about writes updates or ability to write data to, to the channel. Are you okay? So far, so good. Is it clear? A little bit too many information, I understand it. But for now, it's, yeah, of course, this is a complex part. But for now, what we have to try to do, of course, we have to try to run this up and see whether it works or not, right? In order to figure out whether we wrote something, something understandable and wor workable, first of all. So let's try to open a connection. Yeah, it seems that it works. This piece of kind of little bit understandable code, code works. <laughs> so let's try to, to verify whether it's better than kind of blocking AI, right? This is the main idea to, to show all these demonstrations along the better API. So let's try to run our dosser and see whether, yeah, it works, but let's go to, oh, this guy works, that's great. But we missed another point. So in general, it works. It allows us to, to process all the data. But now, if you're going to, to look at our monitor in order to figure out how many processors are busy by doing some work, we have to see, where is that? Where is my CPU? Here we go. We will see that only a few processors will be busy. First of all, because the whole implementation of our business logic is single threaded. Let me show you that. Come on. So now if you're going to this guy, we will see that only one processor, only one thread, define it here, do everything, right? And if you're going to our connection, we will see that basically everything happens on the same thread. I, I don't do any kind of rescheduling of the actions. Everything is executing on the same thread. We don't have anything. So we got, let, let's just do a few debugging actions. Let's just put a few breakpoint here and here. And let's just try to run this guy and to debug it a little bit. Come on, buddy. Do it. Yeah, here we go. Start it. A little bit of marketing for Growl. In order to run the Growl, you have to use just two options. Oleg asked me to do that. He is a noisy guy. Um, now, let's just try to open our console terminal, I mean, and connect to this guy. And here we go. Here we got do unsubscribe. So we accepted the connection and we subscribe it to the stream. So we got this do unsubscribe execution, at which we just say we want to listen, we want to read some data and wake up. And as you can see, I'm going to open this a little bit broad. We are running on default reactive server one on this on, on this thread. Do you see it? Remember it. Then let's go for oh no, not like that, but yeah. <laughs> not like that. Where where I am? Yeah. Here I am. Now let's try to send something. Here we go. We got another breakpoint. And as you can see the same the thread is the same. Do you see it? The th the thread is the same. If you're going to put breakpoint here the thread will be the same. So basically ev every execution, every data handling will be on the same thread. So we have to implement some logic which allows us to, to, to attach our stream, to attach our connection to a particular kind of thread pool or worker. For that purpose, we are going to use scheduler. We will create, we will use kind of predefined it in reactor pa parallel pool of schedulers or of workers. And we will say, OK, let's select only one worker f f from that pool in order to execute everything on exactly th this worker. Because execution on in one thread is the most efficient execution. That's why we are going to use only one, only one worker. But it will be different from the, from the main execution logic. So now let's, do, let's use one operator for that purpose. We have to use only publish on operator here. And we are going to use this scheduler. Do you see it? Yeah, easy, one-liner. The same we have to do here, because now everything will be on the different threads, and our write notifications will happen on the, 
thread main, let's, say, let's name it, or on the server, main server thread. And now we have to execute every kind of byte writing on the same thread as attach it to the connection. So we are going to, to use the same operator here. And now let's just restart our server and ensure that everything is working on a different kind of, on a different threads. So let's wait a second. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Yeah, it started. So let's try to connect again. Here we go. Here we got our connection on the main thread. And now let's try to send some data. Here we go. We got another thread. Do you see parallel one? Great. So if you're going to see whether where the write happens, oh, something going wrong, too many notifications. So let's just remove this debug point and see. Yeah, it's still working. So yeah, we got echo. It works. Looks good. So let's try to run, to run our doser again. Let's just try to run it and see whether our application won't be, will not be broken after all. So let's take a look. Whoa, something went wrong. Just opened a few connections. No, it's something went wrong with our doser. Wait a sec. No, everything goes fine. No, something went wrong. <laughs> we got overflow. So what happened? Do you know? Let me quickly explain what's going on here. So be because before, we kind of processed everything on the same thread, only one thread were involved in the processing, kind of the main thread, the main kind of reactive server, won't be able to, to listen to another, kind of to read another notifications about key on, I'm kind of a, from, the, from, the, um, from the connections, it, it, is, it is ready to, to send some data. It is ready to send some data. And since we do some rescheduling, which can take a few kind of nanoseconds or a little bit more, this notification will happen, will happen, will happen too frequently. So it overflow the publish on buffer, which is used to, to kind of to, to store some events and then to read them on the different thread. And that's what happened here. We just overflowed to, by too many notifications our queue and we crashed our execution. So in order to avoid it, we have to just use one operator on the pressure latest. And it will skip all redundant or all overflowed kind of notifications and will keep only latest, which is most important to us. We don't care about the, the whole of them. We just need to take one and just read data from it, right? We don't need every. And by using only this one guy, we will, we will be able to, to survive our app. So let's just start it. Let's just start it. It started. Let's just restart this guy. Buddy, just restart. And it start, started happening. So let's see. It works. Why it doesn't accept new connections? Come on, buddy. OK, let's just stop everything. Let's use Magic World. And let's just run it again in order to make sure that it works as expected. Wait, what's going on? Come on, this demonstration gods again happened to me. So let me double check whether everything is correct. Come on, so let's try it. Okay, it's running. <coughs> that's not good. I'm just quickly gonna, going to, to, to move to, to the correct implementation, and that's it. The simplest, sorry. I have to do that in order to avoid mistakes during the, during the demonstration. So let's check. Okay, yeah, I have to use here allocate and let's run it again. Okay, kill Java. Kill Java again. Yes, it's working, it started. And the server. Okay, it's running. Great, we got it.
So now we can open another one connection from our terminal and see that everything is really working. Even so, we got 1,000 of open it connection from our DOS or server, which just spam us, spam us, spam us. And if you're going to look at the business of our CPU, we will see that the whole CPUs will be busy by work. Do you see it? It just started kind of collecting data, but it kind of obvious that every CPU is working for us, which is great. So now let's go to yeah another final demonstration of back pressure that we can control back pressure for real. And now I'm going to stop that. And to demonstrate that back pressure really works, I'm going to remove this line which requests data every new for kind of once it got it. So I'm going to restart this guy. Let's just restart it. Yeah. And now I'm going to reconnect from my console and we'll send a data here. I sent it, I got a response, but do you see it? I sent data. At some point it will block, it will disallow me to send, uh, to send data from, from the console, but in general I won't get a response because my server not request any more data. And that's how the back pressure could be controlled as well, which is cool. All right, let's go back to, to the slides and let's do some summary, some final summary. And <coughs> remind what is this most important here. So in order to run everything, for example, on the several workers, Reactor provides us with scheduler parallel. It allows basically to, ru to, run using, to run our execution, to run our stream on the specified or on one of the available workers and process all the data in that way, like this. Only one will be select selected from the pool of them. So to summarize, Neo is still complex, but with such design, it will be much better. It will simplify our li life a lot. Be because reactive streams is designed for simplifying, li uh, of kind of simplifying life when the stream is natural part of execution, right? Because Neo and connection in general is a stream, another stream. So this two paradigms will fit each other really well. Finally, reactive streams bring back pressure, which allows us to control, of course, back pressure on TCP level, on bytes level, unfortunately. But this is better than nothing. And of course, using Project Reactor, you will be able to write really beautiful logic. Finally, what we have implemented is basically what almost happens on the reactor native. So I have here uh, the main developer of, of reactor native, Violetta. So he, she, she will be able to tell you a little bit more, more about internals, but in general, the API is somewhat similar to that. So please just use Project Reactor. And to learn more about Neo, there is a few useful links. There is a video from Heinz Kaboots, uh, for whom I inspired to do this talk. Also, to learn more about Project Reactor and to, to learn more about Project Reactor Netty, just follow those links. Finally, you have to go to the next talk, which is related to real back pressure done on top of any transport, whatever, TCP or iron. And this product or this technology call it R socket. Have you ever heard about R socket before? So if you haven't heard about that, go to this talk, go to Ben and listen from him about our socket, which is designed to back pressure and to reactive streams between microservices. And thank you. The source code is available here.